when you look at the movies, uh, you get the idea, the movies that are showing in theaters and on television, you get the idea of what culture is looking for. Our society seems to be fascinated with power. Uh, there are so many movies about superheroes. Uh, so, some of the biggest box office and highest grossing films uh, are about superheroes. You might be uh, a, f a fan of more the DC side or the Marvel side. My personal favorite uh, superheroes or among them are the uh, Incredibles. It's an entire family made up of superheroes. There, there's something fascinating about the thought of being able to save the city and about being able to fly and climb walls. And, and I think all of these stories and all of these pictures and uh, ideas get at the core of our soul as human beings. We want a savior. We want to be rescued. We, we want to know that when times get tough, and when some, that there's someone watching out for us. And the movies and uh, the comic books, all of that is just make-believe. But for Christians, we have a God who is real. We have a God who is watching out for us. And Christ is our savior. He is our hero. He is Lord. And God's power is transcendent. And the power that was used to raise Christ from the dead is the same power inside of every single believer. But before there could be a resurrection, there first had to be a crucifixion. And that's what we're going to see today. We've been here uh, looking at this at the foot of the cross. We've been uh, going verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark, and we've come to Mark chapter 15. And we saw last time we were together here that Jesus was placed on the cross it said in uh, verse 25 that uh, it was the third hour, which is 9 o'clock in the morning for us. Then at the sixth hour, that was noon. When it was, that's when the sun was at its peak and darkness then covered the entire land. And that lasted for three hours. And then Jesus died at the ninth hour. And look at what happened next here in Mark chapter 15. And we'll, we'll see other passages to fill in some of the gaps here uh, because Mark's just telling one side of the his story. Uh, but Mark 15 verses 42 through 47 says, and when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should, already, should have already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought a, he bought a linen shroud, taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of, Jesus, of Joseph, saw where he was laid. The <clears throat> Jewish Passover celebration was the next day. So this was a sacred day uh, that, that, that was coming, a holy day. And the Sabbath started as soon as the sun went down, and so they were trying to get the body in the grave before 6 p.m. Uh, it, uh, it, would, it would not have been appropriate to have dead bodies hanging on a cross during the Passover Sabbath. So the religious need, leaders needed the, uh, the executions, all of them, because it was Jesus and two thieves beside him, uh, needed these executions to be ex expedited. And they wanted the centurions to kind of press the fast forward button and get to the end. And uh, John 19, uh, 31 tells us that the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they, they might be taken away. And so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified uh, with Jesus. And when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. The fact that they didn't break any of Jesus' bones was fulfillment 
of prophecy, the fact that they struck him in the side and out came blood and water, also fulfillment, fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, thousands of years before in Egypt, when the first Passover occurred, God gave them these instructions uh, in, in Exodus 12, 46. It said, each Passover lamb must be eaten in one house. Do not carry any of the meat outside and do not break any of its bones. So that's part of, the, part of the picture here. And then there's a messianic prophecy from Psalm uh, 3420 that says uh, he keeps all of his bones, not one of them is broken. So for the other victims who were still alive, the soldiers used these wooden mallets that, that would smash their legs, the leg bones. And with their legs broken, the prisoners, you know, they'd been on the cross and they would push up to breathe. And so now with, with their uh, 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 legs broken, they, they had a harder time catching their breath and they would uh, die from suffocation. And so the soldiers broke the legs of these two thieves be, uh, because they were still alive. But Jesus, because he was already dead, uh, they, they didn't uh, have to hit him. They'd have to break anything. And... Uh, John 19.30 explained that he had already given up his spirit. There are some cynics uh, throughout history, skeptics, who have said that Jesus didn't really die. Uh, some doubters have said that he fainted, or they call it that he swooned, uh, that Jesus only lost consciousness and went into some kind of a coma. Uh, these um, unbelievers have tried to distort the story to say that Jesus was still alive and that the reason and the reason these scoffers have wanted to discredit the story is because if if Jesus didn't really die then he didn't really resurrect and if Jesus didn't resurrect then he really isn't the son of God that's what they're trying to get to but know first that Roman soldiers did not mess around when it came to executions Criminals on crosses were, uh, this was a capital punishment case. If the soldiers didn't follow orders, they could also be killed. They didn't want to risk any of that. Secondly, the Romans were expert killers. Uh, they had created an entire empire by conquering and killing. And they knew what a dead body looked like. And the soldiers had no reason to try and make up stories or to risk their own lives by disobeying the orders they'd been given. Uh, they had already, they had no allegiance to Jesus uh, it, while this process was taking place. Uh, they had already whipped him. They'd already mocked him, spit on him. They'd ridiculed him. They tortured him. These centurions were very serious about this. And no one would be taken down from a Roman cross until the job was done. And the reason Jesus died was because the religious leaders initially felt threatened by him. He was arrested through the betrayal of a friend, as we've seen. He was put through these trials. Lies were told about him. Witnesses were called. False accusations were made. Jesus was given the death sentence. He was executed. But all of that was just one side of the story. The other side of the story is that this is why Jesus came. He came to earth to die. He was born to die. God the Father was unfolding his plan to save mankind from destruction. Justice was served and love was displayed all in one sacrifice. God was making a way for us to be reconciled to him. He, he made a way for us to have the opportunity, opportunity to be forgiven uh, of all of our sin, and now we can be adopted into his spiritual family for all eternity. That is the gospel story. The gospel is really the story of God's great love for us, for you and for me. And John 3.16 summarizes it all so beautifully. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Our world it's filled with all kinds of evil. Uh, God sees the pain that we inflict on one another. He sees the atrocities that we commit. He sees all of the misery of this planet and how it 
leads to heartbreak and heartache. And God's response toward our plight isn't anger and wrath. His response is empathy. And we get a picture of that when Jesus was going into Jerusalem for the final time. Um, he, he saw the spiritual condition of the citizens of Jerusalem, and he had compassion on them. Uh, Luke 19.41 says that when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. And that's how God sees humanity. He shows mercy and grace. He leads with love and kindness. The author, the, uh, the author uh, Victor Hugo, wrote an incredible classic novel called Les Miserables. Maybe you've seen the movies, the plays, the books. I've read the books, so many versions of it. Les Miserables tells the story of Jean Valjean, who's a prisoner in France in the early 1800s. Valjean served his time in prison and was released, but he couldn't find a job because he was a felon. And so Valjean finally found a place to stay with a priest. This kind man took Valjean into his home, gave him food and a bed for the night. But the next day, Valjean woke up early and he stole some of the priest's silver and he ran away. The authorities captured Valjean and brought him back to the priest and they told him that Valjean said the priest had given him the silver, these silver pieces. Valjean waited for the priest to have him arrested and sent back to prison. But instead, he was shocked when the priest told the police that he had indeed given these things to Valjean and in fact reprimanded him for not also taking the candlesticks as well, the silver candlesticks. The priest and took Valjean aside and told him, never forget that you promised me to use this silver to become an honest man. Jean Valjean, my brother, he said, you no longer belong to evil, but to good. It is your soul that I'm buying for you. I withdraw it from dark thoughts and from the spirit of perdition, and I give it to God. And so the story of Les Miserables is how Valjean's life was indeed changed from that time forward. The priest in that story gave the most valuable thing that he had in his home, not because he was such a good guest, not because he was a faithful worker, but even while he had stolen the silver from his home, he gave the best that he had to try to change his life. And this kind of mercy is free but it comes at a price. And this is a picture of what God did for us. God did not love us and send Jesus for us because we were so good. He loved us while we were still sinners. When we think of our past and uh, the debris that's left behind, the people we've hurt and those we've disappointed, the failures and our mistakes. As we look back, God knows everything that we've done. And he still offers us mercy. And he says, go and sin no more. And his mercy is free, but it came at a great price. Jesus lived the perfect life and he sacrificed his body and he shed his blood to pay the penalty for our sin. And this mercy has the power to change lives you can walk by faith. We don't have to live in fear anymore. You, you may have some, some enemies conspiring against you, but God will have the final say. You might have struggles with this flesh and its impulses, but the power of God is with you and in you. Keep seeking him with all your heart. Look to him in times of trouble, and he'll give you the strength, and he'll guide you and give you the wisdom when you lack it. And I want to read... Um, uh, the next few, uh, few verses in John 19 because some incredible things happened right here at Jesus' burial. Uh, and John uh, chapter 19 verses 38 through 42 says this. says, after these things, of course, this is jo now John's perspective. Uh, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, 
but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he, he came and took away the body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with some spices. And as the burial custom of the Jews, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Now, that phrase there uh, in verse 38 is very interesting. Joseph of Arimathea, it says, was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. All four Gospels mention Joseph of Arimathea. And up to this point, both Joseph and Nicodemus had not gone public with their faith in Christ. They were both members of the Sanhedrin. They were both part of the group uh, that had uh, Jesus arrested and crucified. Uh, if these two men had let their faith show, they would have been ostracized. They would have um, lost their, uh, could have lost their businesses. They, the religious friends would have turned their backs on them. And, 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 and uh, Nicodemus, this one that mentioned here, was the one who in John chapter 3 came to Jesus by night asking a lot of questions. He's the one that Jesus told that you had to, he had to start over with his understanding of who God was. He had to begin a new relationship with God, like a baby being born. You must be born again, he told him. And in, in John 3, 7, Jesus told him, Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Marvel means that he was shocked, surprised, astonished at what Jesus was telling him. He, he didn't get it. And then verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, How? How can these things be possible? He had a hard time understanding what Jesus was talking about. And Jesus tried to explain it to him in different ways. And Nicodemus was stumped. And uh, Jesus compared this mystery to the wind. He said, the wind blows where it wishes, and, you're, and, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The Greek word, therefore, wind and spirit are the same. So this is like a, a play on words to describe the work of the Holy Spirit in, in a new birth. Like the wind, you can't actually see wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. The wind is very powerful. And that's an example of how the Holy Spirit of God works inside of us. You can't necessarily see the Holy Spirit, but you can see his effects. When a person is born again, the Holy Spirit begins to work in that person. It is internal. Transformation begins. It's hard, hard to see and harder to understand. But you see its effects when you see a cold, calloused man turn into someone who is loving and kind. That's it. When you see a wicked woman change. She becomes whole and good. That's it. It's God at work in her life. It's a mystery. We don't know exactly how this happens, but we see its effects. It becomes obvious to everyone that something unexplaining, something unexplainable, something supernatural is happening. It's powerful. It's transformative. And that night when Jesus met with Nicodemus, the Holy Spirit had not yet come. That wouldn't happen until after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. So this is why Nicodemus was having such a hard, tough time uh, getting all of this to sink in because he had not yet experienced it and he did not yet believe. And we know that because uh, John 3.12 says, uh, Jesus told him, you, you do not believe. <laughs> but after that night, Somewhere along the way, Nicodemus did come to saving faith. Even though Jesus was telling this top religious leader that he had to start all over again like a little baby, Nicodemus had the right attitude about it. He didn't get angry. He didn't seem embarrassed. He didn't walk off in disgust. No, Nicodemus was really searching because he recognized that there was a void inside of his soul. And that void had been gnawing at him. 
He understood that even when he reached the top, he understood that religion couldn't fix his problem. His sin was so deep. Depravity is so vile. We need more than just a makeover. What we need is for our old nature to be made new. We can't just be recycled. We must be reborn from the inside out. And maybe that void has been gnawing at you. You might know the right answers in your brain, but your soul is empty. The old person is still there with its pride and stubborn will, prone to resentment and bitterness, and the guilty feelings, the negative thoughts, the old anxious mindset, the, the bad habits, the cravings and desires and addictions, the old fear and despair and hopelessness, the loneliness, all of that can be so overwhelming. A, make, a makeover would not do. We need our old nature to be made new. We can't be recycled. We must be reborn. And that's the mercy that God offers. When we place our faith in Christ Jesus, we can be born again. And the power of the Holy Spirit comes like a wind sweeping through the soul, transforming us and making us whole. And it's amazing and here you have these two men, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, who somewhere along the way placed their trust in Jesus, and they became secret followers of Christ. And they found themselves behind enemy lines, so to speak. Uh, they were wearing the wrong uh, uniforms. Uh, and, you know, faith is a journey. And when a person is first born again, you don't always know what to do, especially if you're the only one or really the, the, there were only two men of faith among so many other uh, in the Sanhedrin. Uh, they, they had stayed undercover for the most part all this time. And Jesus' 12 disciples at this moment could not be found. John was in proximity, but all the rest had left. And they were nowhere around. And so now, at Jesus' death, um, Nicodemus and Joseph both knew that it was their time to step up. Neither of them could keep their faith hidden anymore, no matter the cost, come what may. It said there that he summoned, he summoned courage. And now was their time they knew to stand up and step in. And they used their connections to get the right permission. They used their wealth to place Jesus' body in a new tomb, which is very expensive. If they, if they had not done this, by the way, um, Jesus' body would have been thrown onto an ash mound used for burning bodies. These executed victims would just be thrown in the mound, and Jesus could still be resurrected. God can do anything, but, but the Romans wouldn't have witnessed this, and it wouldn't have fulfilled prophecy. They, they didn't know it. But by taking Jesus' body down when they did, they fulfilled prophecy spoken hundreds of years before. Isaiah 53, 9 says, He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. Oh. The wealthier citizens in the city would have a tomb carved into the side of a hill. And this cave would have a, a small entrance, sometimes about, usually about four feet high. And then a, when you went inside, there were these compartments inside. Remember, the Israelites were, in their history, they spent 400 years in Egypt. And they'd adopted some of the, the Egyptian burial customs, including the, the mummification process. Except that the, the Jews, uh, they didn't disembowel the, uh, the bodies like the Egyptians did. But they would wrap the body in linens, kind of like a mummy. And then they would cover the, the body with spices and ointments and perfumes. And then a rock would be placed over the entrance so that no one would disturb the body. And when the bodies decayed down to their bones, they would place the, bodies, the, the bones in, bo in a box. 
And that way they could keep their ancestors' bones all in one place. And this is where Jesus' body was put. In a borrowed tomb. Just like predicted. The weatherman can tell us what kind of days we can expect for the week. With all of their scientific data, high-tech equipment, sometimes they get it right, and sometimes they get it wrong. But prophets, with no computers, no equipment, wrote it all down by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit before there was even a hint as to what was going on. And not just general facts. No, they gave details of what Jesus would and would not say. They gave details about what would be done to him. And so it was. Jesus' resurrection is the key to Christianity. That's why the women went to the tomb on the third day after his crucifixion, after, after Jesus uh, died uh, they, were, they were there to finish the burial process. Uh, they were all still grieving his death. They were heartbroken. They were, they were all still devastated. While they were following him, uh, they, they all thought that Jesus was going to establish an earthly kingdom. They didn't yet understand that it was a heavenly kingdom, an invisible kim- kingdom, a spiritual kingdom that he was establishing. It wasn't until they saw him alive again that it started to make sense. It's like when you watch a movie and, and where all the pieces come together uh, in the end, they flash back to this scene and, and that scene, and all of a sudden you get the big picture of how the story unfolded. And that's what the resurrection did for them and for us. It all came together. And they couldn't stop talking about it, sharing the good news with anyone who would hear. In fact, uh, and you fast forward to Acts, uh, Acts chapter 5, uh, two of the apostles were press, uh, arrested for, for preaching. They were, they were telling everyone about the resurrection. And they, they were brought to trial. And the religious leaders told them, look, we will let you go. We won't kill you. But all you have to do is stop talking to people about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And right there in front of them, the apostles basically said, uh, no, we're not going to stop. We're going to say it as long and as loud as we can. Because Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection proves that he is who he says he is. He is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world, our hero, our Savior. He can give us new life. He can cleanse our soul. He can forgive our sins. And he promises to be with us, not just forever and ever, but also here today to help us every step of the way. The veil of the Holy of Holies has been torn in two. We have access to God now. We can pray to him at any time. In times of trouble, he's our hope. In loneliness, he is our friend. In weakness, he's our strength. That's why Ephesians 1.21 says that Jesus is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. Now, names in the Bible were very important, but today, you know, we tend to treat names kind of flippantly. Uh, for example, some parents, uh, I read that some parents named their children Facebook. <laughs> some have named them, uh, and, and if, uh, if you don't like, if you don't want to name them Facebook, name might be taken. Uh, you can also name them like, like you like that post. So some have named their children like. Um, some have named their children Google and Apple. Uh, director uh, Robert Rodriguez right here in Austin. Texas, uh, he has four sons named Racer, Rocket, Rebel, and Rogue. I read that he found those names in a, in a book of dog names. <laughs> and so today we may not quite get the weight of what 
it means that Christ is above every name that is named. But the idea is that you can name anything, and Jesus is above it. Name any king from any time and any realm, and Christ is above that king. Name any demon or devil over any region or rank, and Christ is above that demon or devil. Name a general, name a warrior, name a hero, and Christ is greater. And you can name any habit. You can name any sin. You can name any selfish desire. And you can know that Jesus is above that as well. Name any past experience. Name any regret. And Jesus is above it. You can even name death. And Christ is conquered. He has dominion over all things. He has dominion over everything. He is the only one worthy of all of your allegiance, all of your faith and trust. Look to him as your Savior and Lord, and you'll be saved. Let's go to God together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we have heard with our ears these words today. And I pray that they would sink deep into our souls, embed them firmly within our hearts. And we thank you that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that is at work in us. And to you be the glory forever and ever. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Amen.